Okay, so I can start, right? Yes, you can. Thank you so much. All right, so thank you for this opportunity to um, talk about something that I'm very passionate about. That's um, substance addiction. And um, it's an, an honor to present this um, topic um, to the substance use addiction professionals among some other people. So I'll be talking about addiction and the brain reward system, preliminary insights. And um, please, if I'm not being heard or my slides are not showing, just let me know, please. No problem. So I'll talk, I'll talk about the introduction, um, why this topic is important. Then I would um, say a little bit about the epidemiology or the numbers with regard to substance addiction. And um, I'll talk about addiction um, with regards to the habits, the normal habit cycle. I'll introduce addiction. Then I will talk about the brain reward system and addiction. Then I will discuss management and I'll conclude. Now, um, the World Drug Day, which is um, June 26th, put the theme as people first, stop stigma and discrimination, strengthen prevention. I'm guessing that they believe that the way to stop stigma and discrimination is to educate the public about what really happens in substance addiction having an understanding of substance addiction would make a person less likely to stigmatize a drug abuser or a person suffering from addiction and so. And also having this understanding would also um, strengthen um, campaigns, um, drug abuse campaigns with regard to prevention. So let's start. Is, is addiction, really a problem in the world? Is uh, people who are being affected, are there, is it really a problem in the world? So this slide shows um, world population on the right, on the left, sorry. And it also shows an Nigerian population on the right. Um, there are three pie charts. There's 2016 on the lower left corner, 2021 on the upper left corner. And for the Nigerian population, we have 2017. So these were studies done um, in 2016, 2021 and 2017. It was a survey um, taken from the United Nations Office of Drug and Control. So this study showed that in 2016, 271 million people were using drugs in 2016. So out of the general population of the, of the world, 271 million people were using, and this was 5.5% of the population. The 271 million is showed um, by the light blue color and the yellow color. Now, out of those who were using, you find out that only 35 million people had a substance use disorder or were having addiction problems. And the 35 million means that only 12.9% of those who were using in 2016 had a substance use disorder. Let's fast forward to 2021. We believe that the population then would have grown. And so the number of drug users also grew. So you see that, um, the number of drug users as at the survey in 2021 showed an increase and it is 296 million people of the general world population were using. And this 296 was 5.8% of the world population. And out of this users, about 39.5 million people were having a substance addiction problem. So it's, it's interesting to note that the number of people who were using increased, and it is not just increasing with, reg with respect to the number, to the world population, okay? So it's not, it's, it's actually a proportional increase, but it's not exactly a proportional increase. And also you would observe that the percentages of people who were having an addiction problem was still around 13%. So that did not really change comparing the people who are using to the people who have a substance addiction problem. Let's now look at Nigeria itself. Now this study was done in 2018 and they looked at substance use disorders as well as substance use. 
in 2017 in Nigeria. And what you could find, what you will see here is that the about 14.3 million Nigerians, they used drugs in 2017. And out of these 14.3 million Nigerians, 3 million people were having a substance use disorder. And the 3 million is 21%. That tells you that with Nigeria, you have an even greater number of people who are having a substance use disorder compared to the general population, which shows that indeed, this not, these are serious numbers and, um, prob and um, it's a serious problem that needs to be tackled. Still on looking at the numbers um, with regard to substance use disorders, we have uh, about five different classes of drugs in this picture. What do you see here? On the upper left corner, there are some people drinking alcohol and there are some black arrows on their head. We have two black arrows on their head, that's for the alcohol. Then for the middle point, you see heroin, there are still two black arrows. And for the lower left corner, you see cannabis, we have one black arrow. The nicotine, you see three black arrows and the cocaine, you see two black arrows. Now, if you count the number of people in this, in each of the group, there are 10. So we're looking at the lifetime risk for dependence in people that use substance. There have been some studies that were conducted that showed that, is it everybody who use substance that will become dependent? The study now showed that for alcohol, 15 out of 100 people that use alcohol have a risk or will become dependent or have a risk of, of becoming dependent. Well, for um, opioids, opioid tramadol, codeine, and um, heroin, although this particular study was for heroin, it showed that 21 out of 100 people who are currently using or who use heroin, heroin regularly um, will become dependent. For nicotine, you can see there are three arrows, so three out of 10, that is 32 out of 100. So 32 out of 100 people who use nicotine have a risk of facing dependence. For crack, for cocaine, 17 out of 100 people who use cocaine face um, risk for dependence. For Indian hemp or cannabis, you can see the number is nine, literally now seen in bracket 15. Our previous studies had showed that nine out of 100 people have a risk of becoming dependent. But currently, that figure has increased to 15 because of the increased concentration of THC in the cannabis um, population. So it's now 15 out of 100 people have a risk for becoming dependent. Now, to um, understand better addiction, one needs to look at three um, components. First is drug addiction. What is drug addiction? I like to define drug addiction as a drug influenced type of habit. So this means that I'm likening addiction to a habit. Okay. So drug addiction is a drug influenced type of habit with accompanying loss of function. To further understand this um, terminology, we need to also define what a habit is. And a habit is something that you have learned so these are behavioral responses that you have learned. And these responses are either pleasure seeking or pain avoiding. And the, the good thing about this um, habit is that part of these responses are subconscious and part of it are conscious. Now in a habit, if a habit has four components, it has a cue, the cue or, the, or a trigger, the craving and um, response and a reward. And the third, thing about a habit is that habits basically are formation of new neural circuits. So you have formation of new neural networks in the brain. That is basically what a habit is. If a person has a habit, it means that the brain has undergone some changes and these changes are new neuronal pathways have been formed. That is basically what a habit is. Now let's look at the um, diagram on the right. You can see that there's a cue. And the next cue has the one um, highlighted. Number two is the craving. Number three is the response. And number four is the reward. So you find out that this habit cycle will start from the cue, 
Next is a craving. Next is a response. And the last is a reward. And the reward will now start the cycle all over again to have the cue. To understand this better, let us look at how we can look at this in a normal um, habit. And the best habit to represent, am I being heard? Am I being heard, please? Yes, you are. Okay. So to, to understand um, what a habit is, I choose to use a normal phone pressing habit where some people, they just find out that they are pressing their phones and they don't know why they are doing this. So the first part of the phone pressing habit is a cue. So a person yes. experiences boredom, maybe somebody is talking yes. or giving a lecture. For example, I am giving the lecture now and some of us might be bored already. And while there is boredom, a phone might vibrate to indicate a message. What's the next thing we observe? We, we observe that we feel sort of restless. There, there's some uneasiness in us. And there's this longing or urge to want to know the message content. The next thing is that we find out that we are grabbing our phones and we are reading the message. Now, under the reward, we observe that once we do this, the craving is satisfied. This means that we no longer feel restless. We get to see other messages and social media pages. We are kind of entertained and we feel relaxed and at ease. Now, over time, grabbing your phone is now associated with your phone sending notifications or sending uh, vib vibrations. So you find out that the queue is the bottom or your phone that is beeped. And now that experience of the queue, bottom and your phone beeping will create a craving, which is restlessness and unease. And this is now followed by a response, grabbing your phone, I want to know, to know the message. And the reward you get is that you're no longer feeling restless, that urge is gone and you're entertained. Now, discussing the addiction cycle process, the previous slide was the, a habit cycle. So now this is now an addiction cycle. I explained in the previous slide that an addiction is like a supercharged kind of habit a supercharged in bracket drug charge. So an, a drug has now charged a habit. So this is now an addiction cycle process. And this process still follows the same um, habit cycle. Now the first part of the process is impulsivity. Now, usually the drug use starts with experimentation. Maybe this individual is an in SS3 or SS1 and he wants to fit into the social group of friends. So he, he tries to use drugs. Um, it's, it's the popular thing happening, so why not just try it? And he now tries the drug, he tries maybe alcohol, he tries um, cocaine or some tramadol, and he sees that it is a good feeling. He likes how it's making him feel, it's pleasurable. And that good feeling, in quote, is what would make him want to try it again and again. And so that good feeling that makes him want to try it again is the positive reinforcement. So he's now having to take the drug more and more because it is bringing something positive to his life. The positivity can be, okay, I feel high, I feel euphoric, and that's a good thing. Other positive reinforcements can be, okay, I last longer in bed with, um, for example, with tramadol, or I'm not, yeah, so that is a positive reinforcement. Now he keeps on going on about with the drugs in this light and he's getting positive reinforcement. Till a point in time, he now says, wait till I'm spending too much money on these drugs or I'm, I'm beginning to let go of things that are important to me. Let me just stop this for the moment. He now says that when he has now stopped it, some negative things begin to happen to him. Some negative experience start happening to him. He notices that, okay, I'm feeling restless. I feel as if my body is not all right. I feel like my body is on fire. I'm not sleeping well. This would be withdrawal symptoms. And other times he, there is this sense of craving that accompanies this negative experiences. And so he cannot stop taking the drugs. He has to keep taking the drugs to avoid these negative experiences. At this point, we have reached negative reinforcement. So he's now taking the drugs not really for the positive reinforcement or the positive things, but he's taking the drugs now to stop the negative experiences he's having. Now, still with the negative reinforcement part, sometimes people would use the drugs not for positive reinforcement initially, but the experimentation would now tell them that, okay, 
if I'm taking these drugs, this sadness I've been having since child, since, since I was a child is no more there. This anger, this anger I'm having is no more there. So somehow he's now taking this drug to eliminate the negative experiences that he had been having that are not from the drugs. At this point that he is taking the drugs just because he needs to stop these negative things from happening, it now becomes a compulsion part. That is, if I don't take these drugs, I might die. That's the feeling that his brain is giving him. So the addiction cycle would move from impulsivity, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, and compulsion. All right, so we're still on the addiction cycle process. This slide at the upper left corner, you see somebody on the laptop, pressing the laptop. So this is work and occupation. On the lower left corner, you can see schooling. The upper right corner, there's personal hygiene. And the lower right corner, there's family. So these four things I've mentioned are basically the categories at which a person can function. I explained earlier on that with addiction, it's simply a supercharged habit plus loss of functioning. So the ways that you can function would either be personal care or personal hygiene, um, occupation or work or school, and then functioning your family responsibilities. Now, in the, at the middle of this page of the slide, you can see a brain. And above this brain, you see something written intoxication. And on the right side of the brain, you see withdrawal or negative affects. And on the left side of the brain, you can see preoccupation or anticipation. Now, this is the starting point of the addiction cycle. So let's look at this in, um, in, in detail. The first part is intoxication. This is the point that the person is procuring the, the drugs. He has the cocaine on him. He has the alcohol on him. He has the opioid on him. So he's using it at that point, having the positive feelings, he's feeling high, he's feeling funky and fresh, he's cutting his screws. Now this period, this intoxication phase will continue until the drug has finished. And the drug would finish maybe because there's no more money to buy the drugs or the time that he has put aside for relaxation has finished. Let's use a normal example. For example, a person who wants to, a person who wants to, um, who uses drugs in such manner whereby Monday to Friday, he's doing his normal work activities. And Friday from 4 p.m. to Sunday, 7 p.m., he's saying, I want to enjoy my life, just drugs, okay? So this person will do his normal functioning between Monday and Friday. And then from Friday to Sunday, he's doing his drugs. Now on that Friday by 4 p.m., he now starts his drugs and he's in a hotel, he has people with him, he's getting high. and on Sunday evening, he says, okay, it's time to go to work. Let me just leave these drugs and go to work. Now, while he's at work, he's not doing drugs. He would experience some min minor form of craving, not too strong. He would also experience some negative effects. Like I explained before, withdrawal symptoms, but not too strong. He could be feeling restless, uneasy, not sleeping well, irritable, but it's not too strong. He can manage it for the remaining and five days, Monday to Friday. Now, while he's having this um, effect, this negative effect, he's still walking. He's still able to take his bath. He's still able to do his work. He's still able to do his schooling. If he's a student, he's still able to take care of his family. If he's a married man. But while he's still doing this, he has a preoccupation on weekend. Okay, I need this week to run fast till Friday so I can get the drugs and, and I can have a fun time with my drugs. So while he's working, he's preoccupied. His mind is preoccupied. He might be making plans for the next intoxication phase on a Friday. All right, so the next, um, this slide is just like the previous slide, but the difference is that we have a barrier. The barrier has encapsulated the, the addiction cycle and he now has no contact with functioning. At this point, he has lost his functioning. He can no longer maintain personal hygiene as it was before. There's also a loss in his being able to carry out family responsibilities. There's also a loss in schooling function. Maybe he attends school every day. He's now attending school three times in a week. 
to one time in a week to not attending school again. His work responsibilities, he has cut down on going to work. He would not be even going to work maybe three times in a week to one time in a week. So he's now fo his focus is just on the addiction cycle. He's in a hotel or in his house, he uses his drugs. The drugs would finish because of money or whatever reason. And he would now wait a little bit, a period of abstinence. And when he's now waiting, the withdrawal symptoms will now come. And so would the craving. And so he's now forced to leave where he is to go and find money, do anything possible just to get the drugs. And that will be the preoccupation phase or the drug seeking phase. And he now goes back towards intoxication phase. So that's, that's how the addiction cycle is. It's a revolving cycle without loss of functioning, with loss of functioning. All right, now this um, slide looks at the standard definition of addiction. The first, is, the first definition is from the National Institutes of, of Drug Abuse, and it defines addiction as a long-term problem, a long-term disorder that has a relapsing phase and a remitting phase. So a long-term disorder that has a recovery phase and a relapsing phase. So there's a switch between relapse and recovery. The second definition is by the American Society of Addiction Medicine. And this definition is neuroimaging influenced or neuroimaging mediated. So MRI, um, image, imaging is, is the basis of this particular definition. And this definition says that addiction is primarily a dysfunction in different parts of the brain. Now, this part of the brain that are dysfunction would be the part of the brain that serves the brain reward, the part of the brain that handles motivation, the part of the brain that handles memory and other related circuits. Now, what you would observe in this individual is that they can no longer abstain from drugs consistently. They can no longer self-regulate. They can no longer, they, they cannot even see that they have a problem despite glaring evidence. Okay. Now, this, we're, we're now entering the neurobiology um, of um, addiction. And um, this is a brain structure, and there are three parts of the brain highlighted. The first part is the amygdala, the, this lower part. So you can see where the arrow is pointed, amygdala. The second part is the basal ganglia, and the third part is where that big X is marked, the frontal cortex. Okay, we'll be discussing them in detail. Let's start with the basal ganglia. Now, the basal ganglia is the whole blue thing, the blue thing that has a tail. That's the basal ganglia. And it has a couple of components. Now, the function of the basal ganglia, there are two functions. The first function is, number one, it handles the smooth mean of movements. The fact that you can walk on the road without staggering, your walking is very, very smooth. That's the basal ganglia function. But for now, we don't really care about that function. What we care about is the interpretation of pleasure, experience of reward. That is where we are looking at. So the basal ganglia is responsible for the experience of reward, experience of pleasure. And it also stores habits. So any habit that is formed, that is any neural network, any neural network that is forming to indicate a habit happens in the basal ganglia. Another interesting thing in the basal ganglia is that these habits are a response to dopamine release. Let's now look at the amygdala. The amygdala is a structure, as you can see where it's pointed to, and it's also called the fear center. Its role is to detect threats, anything harmful, any harmful stimulus, you detect, detect it on time and activate appropriate responses to save the human being, the individual. So ways that when you, when you see a dog running towards you, immediately you are afraid, you are, you are anxious, you want to start running away. Your body is like it's on fire. That is the activation of the amygdala. Now you're able to run, and if you were a kind of person that is not very athletic, you're suddenly seeing that you can run faster than people who are athletes, okay? This is a function of the amygdala. It's once it's activated, it takes over. 
Now, in substance addiction, there are problems in these three areas. The amygdala has a problem, the basal ganglia has a problem, and the frontal cortex, which is responsible for decision-making, executive control, your ability to endure the craving, self-control, it's, not, it's no longer functioning. So there's a shutdown of the frontal cortex. Now, how does this relate to um, addiction? Let's start with the basal ganglia first. The basal ganglia, as indicated by the blue arrow, it responds to dopamine. Now, every habit that you have in your life, maybe playing football, watching TV with your friends, chasing goal-directed activities, it is mediated by dopamine. So if you do something that you enjoy doing, like cooking, eating, shawarma, you know, these activities release dopamine in the basal ganglia, okay? And now with addiction, with drug addiction, the basal ganglia is no longer sensitive to dopamine release in it. The only thing that can now release dopamine in this structure is our drugs. So that's why a person can try to eat shawarma and the pleasure from shawarma is not registering anymore again. It's as if the dopamine is not even being released again. Okay, so the, this part of the brain is no longer sensitive to dopamine release from other previously pleasurable activities. That is why this individual will lose interest in any other thing, goal-directed um, um, affairs, it's no more there. Okay, this is now a more detailed um, structure of the brain. Now, let's start with the addiction process. Now, let's assume I'm offered crack cocaine, cocaine. Somebody offers me cocaine. I now take this cocaine into my body. Now, what this molecule does is that it activates a center in the brain called the ventral tegmental area. Is the green dot that is behind, it's there. Now, so this area is activated just because I've taken cocaine. If I'm taking alcohol, it is also activated. If I've taken opioid, tra tramadol, it's also activated. If I've taken Indian hemp, it's also activated. But the difference is that the, this ventral tegment, tegmental area's activation is meant to release dopamine, okay? It releases dopamine directly to the different brain structures. So there's a connection from this ventral tegmental area or VTA to the frontal cortex. There's also connection from this VTA to the limbic system or the pleasure interpreting system. Hello. There's also a third functioning. Am I being heard? Hello, am I being heard? Yes, sir. Yes, you're heard? Being, continue, you're being heard. Okay, thank you. So. Um, the person takes crack cocaine, dopamine directly to the basal ganglia. If a person is taking other drugs like alcohol, dopamine is not released directly. Rather, it's mediated through another, other neurotransmitters, for example, glutamate or GABA. So GABA can be inhibited before dopamine is now released. Now, where is this dopamine released in? After the individual's VTA, that green area there has been activated, dopamine neurons, dopamine neurons feed to the basal ganglia. And now in the basal ganglia, to be specific, the nucleus accumbens, dopamine is released in the nucleus accumbens, which is that red thing that is there. It's a part of the basal ganglia. Now, the the repeated the dopamine release. Can I go on? All right, please just be giving me the time, how many minutes I have left so that I can um, be fast. The yeah, repeated dopamine. Sorry? 10 minutes more. Okay, okay, fine. I, I can rush to that. Okay, I can rush to that. All right. So the repeated dopamine release in the basal ganglia is what creates habits. 
And this habit creation is done through, through two processes, neuromodulation so, and neuroplasticity. So you find out that there are now new branches of neurons in the basal ganglia, which is what they call, which is habits. So habits, like I explained, is basically new neural network being formed. So after the habits are, are now formed, the um, frontal cortex, which role, which has a role in goal-mediated um, actions, it's no longer fully able to influence the basal ganglia because of the drug. So there is some form of dysfunction in the neural circuits that link the frontal cortex to the basal ganglia. And because of this, the individual can no longer fully engage in goal-directed activities. The only goal-directed activities is linked towards drug use. After this process has now taken place, after some time, when the individual no longer has a drug in his system, and there's now low dopamine in the blood, the amygdala kicks in. Wait till there's no dopamine in the blood. They just, this individual might be dying. So he, the amygdala is now being active. It now creates symptoms like fear, stress, irritability, and anxiety states. That's because it is linked to other stress um, structures like the, um, the adrenal gland, the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland, which now release cortisol, endotropins, all these um, stress factors. And now the stress factors would now activate the amygdala, which will now cause the compulsion to do the undurable, sell things, sell your bodies just to get the drugs. Let's go on. So I, I'm gonna liken addiction to a, an angry state. Now picture that the last time that you were angry, I'm sure we can all picture the last time we were angry. Maybe somebody annoyed us. Now, in that particular state, we cannot make logical decisions. Sensory input is not really as in, it's not really interpreted like it will be if we were calm. People will talk to us. It's not really, um, we don't really see it that way. That angry state, the only way we can now see things rationally is if we can leave that angry state. Now, addiction is likened to an angry state that is maintained, a maintained angry state. Now, this angry state, you cannot make decisions that make sense. Things, uh, trying to apply logic and rationality is not possible. Now, things that maintain this angry this state is withdrawal symptoms, the craving, the knowledge that they can get away with the drug taking behavior, also co-occurring mental disorders like borderline personality or antisocial personality. Also the fact that the drugs has been an escape from their harsh reality. All of this maintain, all of this maintain the state called the drug mind. So what do we do in, um, how do we handle addiction? The first part is um, pharmacotherapy. We have drugs that are um, used in management of addiction. Now, these drugs are used usually in the detoxification phase. You want to make detoxification easy, easier and more comfortable, as well as used in harm reduction. Now, um, buprenorphine, methadone, these are drugs that would help with um, detox or detoxification. They are um, opioid, yeah, opioid um, agonists, they bind the receptors and um, they have a longer half-life than other opioid. And so they can now be used in this case. They don't um, give rise to withdrawal symptoms. Then there's um, disulfiram and acomprosate. These are used for alcohol and the yeah, disulfiram is for the um, aversion therapy while acamprosate changes the brain signaling in the brain changes the brain signal and the person no longer experiences craving. Um, yeah, we also have um, experimental drug AEF0117, which was, um, it's a new drug that, that is selective for the cannabinoid one receptor inhibition. And this has been shown to reduce cravings. So the drugs themselves are only helpful either for harm reduction or for ease of detoxification. All right, now still on management, you will manage withdrawal symptoms as I explained in the previous slide. 
Now for relapse prevention, you want to decide, is my goal abstinence? Or is my goal reducing my drug use? Or is my goal dialectical abstinence? The dialectical abstinence means you're doing abstinence plus harm reduction. 100% abstinence, 100% um, reduction. So in management for relapse prevention, you have to teach these people how to identify the cues or the triggers. Remember that the cues and triggers themselves also activate the nucleus accumbens, just like taking the drugs will. So you must teach them to identify their cues on time, and this can be done during admission. The number two, you will teach them relaxation exercises like mindfulness and odd suffering. The reason for this is that once their cue is activated, or if their amygdala is activated, the overwhelming nature that they experience is less overwhelming because they have practiced mindfulness and odd suffering. You also need to provide alternate reinforcement. That's where distraction come in. So distractions are basically alternate positive reinforcement. So you must choose distractions that are specifically suited to the individual. Most times you hear people say three Ds, chew gum, um, take a walk. So you must choose the one that is specific to the patient. All right, so treat comorbidities. Um, research has showed that lots of drug abusers have depression and um, a large proportion have personality disorder. So you must identify and treat this aspect. Then you must teach skill training for people who use drugs to boost their morale, people who are shy, you need to teach skills because this would now address negative reinforcement. You'd also teach goal directed activities and responsibilities. This would help with the frontal cortex, engage the cortex more in goal directed activities. We also um, apply dialectical behavioral therapy. All right, just before I close, I will just say a brief on behavioral change principles. If you want a person who is having a substance use problem to change, you need to be sure that three things are in place. Number one, this person is motivated. Now, what can cause motivation? First, pleasure. Number two, inspiration. So pleasure can motivate a person to change and so can inspiration. And this will be in the direction of the change. Pain can also cause a motivation to change, but this will not be in a direction away from the pain. Number two, action step taking process. This has to be present before a person can change. Now, what are some things that can make a person start taking steps towards change? Number one, the person has support. The person has seen that he has support. So he has seen that people in the environment are helping him financial, whatever aspect towards change. Number two, you have provided this person with the know-how, the knowledge on how to change. It's one thing to tell the person, stop using drugs. And another thing to tell the person to show the person the steps to take to stop using drugs. Number three, for a person to want to start taking steps, he must perceive that it's very easy, all right? The third part of behavioral change is maintaining this change, sustaining this change. Two things have to be present before a person will sustain or maintain the change. The first is routine formation, meaning that this person must have practiced alternative habits daily on and on and on and on and on. Remember that a habit is never ends. All you can do is to replace the habit with something else. So you're teaching this person a new routine to replace the old habits. Then lastly, whatever made this person change in the first place has to be there. So if you're making a pain, if you're motivating a person to change out of pain, you must be sure that when this person has changed, this pain must be still there. So if a pain motivation is, if you use drugs, I will admit you in the world. It means that even if he has stopped using drugs, he must still be admitted in the world for this motivation or this change to be sustained. So um, come to the end of the webinar. Um, thank you to my references. Thank you.
All right. Thank you so much. That was so profound. Like I really learned a lot. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to entertain two questions, please. If you have a question, kindly drop it. We have less than 10 minutes to be here. Please, if you have a question, you can unmute yourself and ask just two questions or you drop it on the chat box. Thank you. And please, if you've not given us your detail as the participant, please just drop it. 